aren't you? Really are. <laughs> hey, buddy. Hey, Will. Yeah, they're. You can tell they're open. Uh -huh. Or kind of open. Yeah. Before I even took a pregnancy test and knew I was pregnant, one of my like very first symptoms was I was having these crazy vivid dreams. Like I knew something was going on with my body. Like I never remember my dreams. And we weren't finding out the gender, but very early in the pregnancy, I had a dream and in my dream, I was standing in the nursery at the changing table changing a baby boy's diaper. And so, I told Patrick then, I said, it's, I knew it was a boy. And I told everybody that. That was like a gift from God. Like, I've, and I don't have dreams anymore, you know? It's like, after I had Will, it stopped. But I just feel like God gave me that sweet little dream of changing his diaper so we would know and to give me hope on like really, really, really bad days. Like, no, Jill, I gave you this vision. Like, you're gonna be there and he's gonna be home. So everything kind of started on Friday, and we tried to chill out. Patrick stained our deck all by himself. Chilling up. Staining the deck is pretty chill. Though. Yeah, so we weren't real chill. So. Jill was chill. I was not chill. No, I was like selling everything that wasn't a necessity. Like hindsight 2020, I was nesting hardcore. The really cool thing is that, you know, we were doing this on Friday and Saturday and Sunday. On Friday, we closed on a house that we flipped in Homewood. We got that completely off our, our plate. We remodeled a lady's house and finished it that week. God knew we didn't need anything extra on our plate because we were going to have a 129 day journey. And then Sunday morning I was like, I'm just not feeling great. I just kind of think we need to stay here and chill. So that lasted for like 15 minutes. And then I got up and went downstairs to the basement to keep like, to pick up where I left off on Saturday. And Patrick came down there a little while later to check on me. And I told him, I said, I keep having these like crazy gas pains. And like, you know, looking back, it's like almost comical now because I would have, I was having these gas pains and I would have to sit down. Like I would sit down and then I'd be like, oh, the gas pain. they timed out like The gas pain has apart. stopped. Right. And so Two then I get up apart. and keep working. And it was just, I just wasn't even thinking about it. I was 23 weeks pregnant. But when Patrick came downstairs and I was like, I'm having these crazy gas pains. And I actually like leaned back and I let him fill my stomach. And I was like, I'm having one right now. And I was making him fill my stomach because my stomach was so tight. Could the writing not have been more clear that like you are in labor. So we get to the hospital and they hook me up to the monitors and like my nothing was picking up. The contractions weren't picking up on the monitors. And I kept telling Patrick, like, I'm so embarrassed that we came up here, for that we came pains. up here for gas pains. When we got back upstairs to labor and delivery, I was in the wheelchair and our nurse, Lori, she was standing at like the nurses, the main nurses station and she was on the phone and she just had this look on her face and she said, have you had any steroids during pregnancy? And I was like, no, I haven't been sick. Like I'm not thinking like steroids for early delivery, like to build baby's lungs up. So I was like, no, no steroids, you know, as, as they're willing me by. And so they 
wheel me back into the room where we were and I feel like there were like three or four people in there and they were all standing. They were wheeling baby warmers. They were wheeling like all these machines. They put us in a room. There was like 15 staff members in there trying to get an IV started. They couldn't get an IV started to give her her steroids. And so it immediately, it changed and all of a sudden there were all these people, but they were like, they told us and I look back today at the text message that Patrick sent his mom and sister and it was like, we're being admitted right now. Her cervix is at one centimeter. They think we'll be here for probably two days, maybe longer to monitor her. But it's crazy now talking to our friends who were, we now feel like know everybody in the NICU at St. Vincent's. And we've talked to, there were several of them that told us like they were working on that Sunday night and word in the NICU was to like, get ready. Like, I think we're about to deliver yeah, 23 weeks a 23 week or like, we didn't know that. And I'm so thankful now that we didn't know that. The neonatologist came yeah. to see us and he came and told us the statistics. And at that point, we didn't know if we were having a boy or a girl and white males statistically do the worst. At that point, I think that's when we started realizing that they really think we're gonna have this baby. We're not just gonna be yeah. watched for two days. Yeah, and it was like 40% chance of survival, and then those that survive, half, 50% of them have a severe, severe mental or physical handicap. Really, after the neonatologist came in, like, we both cried, and we were just really, really, really overwhelmed. And but that's when we started kind of knowing that God was, you know, he had his hand on on that, or on our situation. Um, I just got a new iPhone and I never had, like I had the Bible app, but I'd never had a notification from my Bible app. But my phone buzzed as soon as he left the room and it was Jeremiah 1-5 and it said, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I set you apart. I anointed you as a prophet to the nations. And we were just kind of like, Okay. When all the odds were stacked against us, I felt like God like kept like kind of giving us a lifeline and like being like, you're gonna be okay. We felt so, it took us a long time to really like absorb what was happening. Like there are very clear things that happen. Like when you walked in the NICU at, at St. Vincent's, a huge sign that said no perfume like no smoking, no perfume or something. And it was like the second or third day that we were walking in the NICU, I told Patrick, I said, I said, Patrick, I ran out of my perfume last week. And I ran, and I it, ran out of he my said, cologne. Like, That's weird you say that. I ran out of my cologne that last week. Like us closing on the house that Friday and then us finishing the other project like on Saturday and there was some stuff I had going on at work. Even going back to the, me taking a different job and being able to have that opportunity so that she could stay home. There are like little things that God has like made a way for that it just yeah. became, okay, clearly this was his plan all along. So Wednesday, they took me off the magnesium and Thursday, they had arranged for one of the high risk OBs to come check me to see if they could do an emergency cerclage to try and stitch my cervix together to hold it closed. And by the time the doctor got there on Thursday, I was so far into, I was, my contractions were so strong I could hardly talk to her. You know, I, it was very clear, like my labor started back up on Thursday morning. Mm -hmm. And and then once it started, they tried to hook me back up to the magnesium. They tried to throw everything at me and it was like, there was no stopping it. <laughs> So thankfully, labor and delivery was really smooth, all things considered. I remember there was like probably 25 people in the room when, when he was born. There was two nurses, one was holding my hand, one was holding my back. <laughs> I about passed out when I saw the um, epidural needle. What should have been like a very traumatic, horrific experience delivering this baby at 23 weeks and five days. Like, they made it like really special. I delivered and then they kind of like took him to the corner of the room and they're all starting to work on him. And so Patrick was over there, but one of the nurses got our phone and was taking pictures. And it's just really sweet to look back at those pictures 
and see all the nurses like smiling so big that like even that they were just so happy for us even though it was like very less than ideal <laughs> um it, they still were like i look back and i'm like oh i'm so thankful for them so that kind of started things and then Will went straight to the NICU and his nurse was, her name was Amy. And I remember Patrick coming and telling me like, Jill, you're gonna be so thankful. We've got this nurse, she is like amazing. Will is in like the best hands ever. She was just so great. Yeah, she worked seven straight days. She worked seven straight 12s. I think she was supposed to work like two or three days. Yeah. And then she kept, she kept calling in to, signing up to take yeah. on more days. And I remember Amy would always say, she said, you know, I'm not gonna sugarcoat things. She would kind of tell us like it was, but I remember she was leaving, I think like on a Thursday and she wouldn't be back until like the next Tuesday. I think it was the next Tuesday. And I still remember her telling me before she left, I really think he's gonna be here when I get back. And I was like, really? You know, I was yeah, like, we were just like, we were so like clinging on, we were like clinging onto that. Yeah. We were like, because it oh was so gosh. touch and go there in the in the beginning, you know there was there's two times at, at St. Vincent's where his his kidney shut completely down. Um, I remember going in and one of the doctors telling us that um, we were going to try steroids as a last ditch effort for his lungs, um, and and if it didn't work, then you know that was that was basically we were at the end of the road. Um, and we had Jill had two two baby showers, three baby showers planned. Um, you know, right there within the next week or two. June, yeah. yeah. And so um, I called my mom and I said, we need to, we need to cancel these baby showers. I don't, I don't know if he's going to make it. And he's doing so bad right now that um, I don't want her to go into a baby shower and have to open gifts for a baby that may not make it. Um, just because the yeah. doctor had just, you know, he basically, he was just being brutally honest with us about where we were. I even, I remember one point, mm -hmm. Right after that, I called my work, called my HR department to see what the bereavement schedule or the bereavement leave was. It's like pre preparing yourself for the absolute worst. It was like the weirdest thing where we like felt like we didn't want to get our hopes up. We wanted to prepare ourselves for the worst, but you're like trying to like cling to your faith and like hoping for a miracle and hoping for the best. It, it, it was just like a constant struggle of like trying to be like realistic and like we every day we would go into the NICU and we would look at Will's chest x-rays and for a while there we could they actually put them up on the screen for us one day and we could see a progression over a week of his lungs getting worse and worse and worse and worse. Hey sweet boy. Hey there. And so at that point, that's when we were transferred to Children's, and that was a really, really hard leave. Like, we knew Will needed um, to have some specialists looking at him because his case was so complex, his kidneys were failing, and we were kind of playing hot potato with organs is what it felt like for a while. It was like we would get one thing good, and then the next thing would... The next organ would shut down. So, so we got Will to Children's, and that was just like a really hard transition at the beginning because St. Vincent's had really like become like family. That's all we had known. And so we were terrified to leave. These people knew us, they loved us. I mean, the day I posted an update on Will's page that we were leaving to go to Children's and um, two of my labor and delivery nurses saw the update and they came over and they were both crying and hugged me. And they told me all the L&D nurses that morning had prayed for Will. Like they prayed for him just that morning. but. Um, it was hard leaving because we really felt like everybody there like loved us and it like really rallied around us. And we loved them. Yeah. yeah. Oh yeah. Some of our best friends from like my hometown, um, the husband, he's actually like a mortician. So he like rode around for weeks with this little baby Moses basket in the back of his car. He had talked to the people in Jefferson County that if they got the call, for Will Taylor that he had passed that for they were to call him and he was going to come get him and everything and take care of us. And so, you know, it was it was that it was that crazy. Then we got to Children's and um, Dr. Fursley was Will's doctor and he, Will had a team of doctors there and and Will was extremely sick. His kidneys weren't functioning right, so he was he was like three times the size. He was so swollen, like 
unrecognizable. <laughs> oh, buddy. Oh, buddy, you're okay. Shh. Will, you're okay, buddy. You're okay. Hey, you're okay. You're okay. Hey, I'm so sorry. And I, I've been a Christian for a long time, but you know, your faith isn't tested until you're squeezed a little bit. And when you are in the situation where you know you're used to, you're usually able to fix whatever is going on wrong in your life, and then God puts you in the situation where. The only thing you can do is, is pray and, and trust in Him. And that was the hardest part is that I couldn't fix Jill from not going into labor. I couldn't fix Will being Very able to nice. breathe on his on his own. I was dealing, like what Patrick said, like I was dealing with a lot of guilt at the beginning. Like I just, I couldn't understand, you know, I remember looking at Will, he was little bitty, one pound, eight ounces but he was like so perfect. You know, I remember looking at him and being like, he's so perfect, he just needed more time. There were a lot of days where the word that like kept coming to my mind was cruel. I would, in my mind, think, God, this is so cruel. I remember just sitting in there at 4.30 in the morning, I would go up there and I would just pray with him while he was in that little incubator. And I just remember thinking like, this is not fair, you know? Like, like I've lost my dad, who is like my best friend, a super awesome guy. Jill lost her mom, um, and now we're, you know, now you put this on her plate, God, like, really? And I felt like there, were, there was kind of like this storm, like this out of control storm, like going on around us. And it was almost like, you know, God was kind of like asking us to walk on water. And it felt so impossible, but I feel like we had such an amazing like community of like friends and family. Even in those times when we didn't feel like we even knew what to pray or how to pray, we had so many people praying on our behalf and yeah. like kind of covering us in scripture. And I feel like God like really put people in our path and put the right scripture at just the right moment. There's been people that we have no clue who they are. We've never met them. We've never seen them. We don't even know. We've never even heard their names. One lady made a blanket for Will. I mean, the people have sent us things. People have... I mean, even friends that like I didn't even know prayed would call me on the phone and say, hey, can I pray with you? You know, and then it got to the point where we were like, okay, God, like you use this situation, like you use this, this, this whole situation. If, you know, if Will's not going to make it, let Will's life touch somebody and, and, and lead them to Christ or, or help them become a stronger Christian. No matter what happens, we're going to, we're going to, our hope is in you. But it's like slowly but surely, you know, they started tweaking things here and there and he started a little better every day. getting better. And, and it was kind of the same thing we experienced at St. Vincent's. We had some really, really, really awesome nurses. God like really provided the right people at Children's yeah. and, and we got really comfortable there. And Patrick, he got to hold Will, I think it was like almost 50 days after he was born, Patrick got to hold Will for the first time. I've never been an emotional person, like at all. Like ever since my dad passed away, I just I just compartmentalize things. I push it in the back and I just put my nose down and keep moving. But when I got to hold him and I, I, I got to feel him and I got to look at him and I got to talk to him and pray with him, it was, I got extremely emotional. I turned into like a little a puddle, like I was a basket case. With me, it was just, you know, I know I'm gonna be a dad. I know he's in there. I've been looking at him. I've been praying for him. I've been crying about him. I've been so sad and so happy, but it didn't become, you know, real until I got to, I got to hold him and it was just a flood of emotion. They had told us, and it was, it went on for about two weeks that that Will was doing so well that we may go, we may get to be moved to, to UAB at some point. Mm -hmm. And so we were finally moved to UAB. We went to the, the R&I NICU. We were um, in the NICU at UAB for I think like three weeks and then got moved to the continuing care nursery. And then on October 7th, um, his 129th day, um, that's when we got to leave. No, my hands are cold. Mama's hands are so cold. Hi. Hi. <laughs> <laughs>
days in the NICU that I would just think back on that dream of me standing, you know, in the nursery changing a baby boy's diaper. And I just knew, I knew like I knew that we were going to get there. to explain it all these things that were set into motion when our world felt like it was spinning out of control he was like showing us like no I'm actually I, I have my hand in this and I've got you guys it feels like very chaotic but here you can see these little he was giving us these little glimpses of how he was still in control and he was still sovereign over everything that was happening mm -hmm. 